Welcome to the NBA Show Reviews. I am your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is James. Hello, everyone. Norman, why are you in the driver's seat today? Because I wanted to drive. I don't want you to drive. I'm going to put a crop on your field, and I don't care what you have to say about it. I don't care, because I want to drive. And also joining us in this adventure we're having in the car of fantasy. I got no idea how to go through that. It's Silver Quill. It's a ban. <laughs> Hey dog! Let's get us some moonshine and go shoot something! Yoo-hee! I call shotgun! I call machine gun! <laughs> I call the roof of the sniper! Oh, who's driving then? The goat is driving! <laughs> oh god. I never understood that expression, shotgun. Oh, the expression shotgun was derived from the old west where calling shotgun is where you help the driver hold the shotgun and shoot at, um, I think thieves during the west. What was it called during the golden age? I forgot when travelers travel from the west to mine for gold. Caravaneers? Something like that. I don't forget. It's one of those things that you play on the PC called the Oregon Trail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. Similar to that. Now, wouldn't this be a more interesting episode if it said, Violet Sparkle died of dysentery? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, wow. Anywho, but anywho. In today's episode review, we're going to review the Who Feels vs. the McCults. Yes, this is an interesting episode, and I have no idea how to sell this. How do even? We finally see Twilight fulfill her ambition and actually do something with the friendship map. Yay. <laughs> yes, that, that is She's not bored anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anywho, um, I think first impressions are in account. So, uh, James, what about you? Oh, my gosh, you're putting me on the line first? Well, of course, because I'm not driving. So, it's alphabetical order straight up. My God. What to say about this episode? You know, I'm going to be honest with you. This episode and the next other one that we are going to be reviewing, I didn't watch them as much as I watched every other episode. And it's not because I didn't like them. I think this episode is a much better story about conflict and conflict resolution than the, I think, other episode that we have about conflict and conflict resolution, which was Over a Barrel. I like many aspects of this, and I don't think I dislike any, but I am meh about some parts of it. We're, get, we're gonna get to that when we get to that, but yeah, I will say this one is definitely slightly above average for me. This was a, a fairly good episode. And Silver, how about you, man? Well, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I mean, one, it stars my favorite and third favorite ponies, which is always a bonus. Uh, it features Fluttershy being adorable, Squee. There were some very likable characters, some truly bizarre designs, which were just fun to see. It is the kidified version of an actual historical conflict, much like, as James said, over a barrel. But uh, this one, the Hatfields and the McCoys were one of the bloodiest feuds in American history. I think people will view it in very different forms depending on how much they view the kidified. They're, they're using produce rather than uh, bullets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought they were using pies for weaponry in Equestria. Well, Equestrians seem to take whatever's at hand, or uh, both. <laughs> yeah. Well, then again, when you can have carrots that can literally embed themselves into wooden doors, I think you can definitely weaponize food. Believe me, Brussels sprouts should be outlawed by the uh, Geneva Convention. Those things were used to poison one of the king of France, so yeah. Uh, history lessons. No, 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 it was, it, it's not real, I'm making it up. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, just talking about this one, dis- but still. <laughs> they are disgusting, I hate Brussels sprouts. Uh, but still, still. But either way, I think this episode favors Twilight a little more than Fluttershy in that Twilight is pushing herself so hard to solve this friendship problem. And Fluttershy, being the kind, supportive, but also timid character, is allows herself to be in the background for a good part of it. As for me, how do I put this? It's one of those episodes where I've seen a billion times. It's been done to death. And yeah, it may get boring here and there, but it's rather entertaining in some parts. The lesson with this one is a bit muddy, if you ask me. I don't know how to explain this, but because of two person from way back when have unmoving egos or unmoving opinions about something, they start a clan war. And then they end up forgetting about what they were fighting to begin with. Yeah, so to me, this is rather dull in terms of the premise, but a good show nonetheless. With first impressions out of the way, I think we should take this scene by scene and we should start, right? 
Yeah, st- let's go with start, Stand by Sam. Yep. Start with hyper adorableness. Yep, and as per usual, spoilers are hit, so you you have been warned. I think the episode has been out for like, like what months. If people haven't watched it already, you guys had your chance. There is a non-written rule that no spoilers for the f- first seven days, or else you like get get out. <laughs> Well, either or, but still, we start off the episode in Fluttershy's Cottage, where we see her animal friends having a book club. And what book are they reading again? Uh, Wuthering Hooves, was it? Yep, as always, it's probably a wordplay. Knowing this universe, yeah, it's going to be a wordplay on something. And you know what? The gallery page has something. And Wuthering Heights. Huh, that is a real play by author Emily Bonnet. Yes. Now personally, now, personally, I would have had them read Animal Farm, but that's just me. Uh... <laughs> no, that will give Angel Bunny very, very bad ideas that you don't want to have, him to have. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, because uh, Angel is so pure of heart unless he receives the influence from them video games. <laughs> oh, you oh, know? No, 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 I don't mean that. I mean that Angel is already corrupt to the bone. <laughs> You don't want you don't want to push him that little bit more. You don't want to give him more ideas. Like, oh, so that's what I'm supposed to. Do. I don't mind. So the shy and the gang read what they ship down. Oh, what if they read Silence of the Lambs? <laughs> that would be good. Or how about Water for Elephants? Oh no, I cannot read that novel anymore. No wait, thanks wait, to the no, yeah, no. Sh- no, I know what it is. I know what they should read. What? Old Yeller. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's for Applejack. <laughs> Here's this. What about them watching the animal, Rob Schneider's movie? Oh, God. <laughs> then, no, you know then... what? They should be reading Little Phillies by... Uh... Uh, oh, what was the, who was the writer of Little Women? I completely <laughs> forgot. But ah. anyway, we're, we're distracted. But we Here's how we want to do this. Like I think making parodies of the book club is much more fun. But anyway, uh, we have them going to talk about this book. And suddenly, Fluttershy's butt vibrates. Yes. In fact, unlike every other uh, Cutie Mark summons... It physically floats in the air and and drifts away. The beacon. Fluttershy's not the most observant of the main six. So not only is she the well, I will say Pinkie Pie is less observant than Fluttershy. But Pinkie Pie will at least go where where she knows she's needed. Fluttershy needs a little bit of extra push. So I think the Met knows that. Yeah. Besides, she's like living in the outskirts of Ponyville, so she will need like a GPS. X kind of like system where she's like, okay, you have to go this way. She's going to her friend's castle. There's only one castle in Ponyville. She doesn't really know that. Oh, God. But if besides that, okay, after being summoned by the cutie mark, map, whatever it's called, um, Fluttershy tells her friend, um, don't start the book club or don't start the book discussion without me. And yeah, nobody really cares. They, they just continue on and discuss about the book in a very funny way. I wonder what they're talking about. <laughs> they are rather civil about it. There is no, like, shouting and angering. Like, that's... I, I was surprised that Angel didn't start to slap people with the book. That's what Angel from Season 1 and 2 would have done. <laughs> he would have started slapping animals not with yet, the book. Not yet, not This is just the beginning of the book. Wait until we get to the middle. Wait until it gets to the Shyamalan-esque twist. Mm. <laughs> It turns out you weren't living with your grandparents all along. Oh, dun, boy. dun, dun. So, after that, we head to the castle where we see Twilight preparing for their journey. And this was just five minutes ago. And yet she is a marvelous researcher. In all honesty, I think she's probably had this ready and waiting ever since the map first appeared. Uh, just waiting for her time to start. She has been waiting. Plotty, scheming, but mostly reading. Oh, yeah, <laughs> read. How could she be bored? Hi. Because at some point, every princess goes the Disney route and wants more. Don't we all? I want more. <laughs> uh, but the map tells them they need to go to the Smoky Mountains. It's a very beautiful place, and everything seems to be very beautiful. I, I think this is a trip for Fluttershy, because it's all wildery and Nichiri, that's her gig. And produce. Which at first I thought, which at, which at first I thought, well, Smoky Mountains, oh no, they're gonna have to face a dragon, oh no, wait a minute, that's the Misty Mountains. Okay, I got it wrong. <laughs> Forget about it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this setting is based on a, uh, it's very similar to a Disney cartoon, which name is escaping me right now. I cannot remember. You guys know the cartoon I'm talking about? Like, 
the two hills separated by a valley and uh, a, a feud between two families. And oh, that's, uh, oh, that's, uh, goof troop. Was, <laughs> they, they did, did that. I do remember. They did, did that. I don't I just think it was goof troop. They did, did that. that. I remember that. It's like, like Goofy goof and, troop. Goofy and Pete were not agreeing and they were at war, but Pete's son and, I think Pete Jr. and Max wanted to play with each other because they're teens and they wanted to have fun. Yeah, I remember the episode. Oh my god, this so wasn't what I meant. <laughs> But well, I think I know what you mean, James. I, Disney done a lot of those kind of shows before. Or how about Kim Possible? Was it that episode? Gargoyles, that was it. Yeah. There, no, there's a lot. No, there's a... I feel like, I feel dumb now. I'm, I'm just, I'm just gonna derail this entire review with Disney mention. I know. It, the great classic Mighty Ducks. Oh god. Oh no, dude. That cartoon was excellent. Are you talking about anything, the movie? Anything... Anything with G- Tim Curry and Tony J as the bad guys is worth watching. <laughs> well, okay, boys. Let, let's tie us out down to MLP for a bit before we go AWOL <laughs> with other things. AWOL. Yeah. Well, let's no, this... <laughs> Well, then you, you best get to talk about Ma Hutfield then, sonny. Uh, all righty then. So anyway, we see them get ready to head off to the Smoky Mountains via balloon. When they arrive... They get assaulted by produce. Uh, I have to address one thing. People were complaining, oh, why are they traveling on the balloon? They both have wings. Why can't they fly? And I'm like, you have legs. Why don't you just walk from state to state instead of taking a car? <laughs> so like, after a while, your wings are going to get tired. <laughs> of course, you're going to have to drive somewhere, like travel with another mean. I mean, come on. Not to mention Twilight is the uh, newest flyer and not very experienced, and Fluttershy is the weakest flyer, not very experienced. Plus, this is just a long way that they need to head off. If you think about it, you do have who, again, um, Rainbow Dash and Pinkie Pie flying towards the Griffin Empire. Why didn't they fly there? Rainbow Dash could carry Pinkie Pie. Yeah. I found it. I found it. I found it. What did you As found? As you guys were discussing, I found what the episode is referencing. The episode is referencing um, a Disney cartoon called Make My Music. And I just linked uh, the picture comparison picture comparison here in an internet podcast. You can put this on the episode later if you want, Norman. Like, insert it. And that's uh, what is very much uh, referencing. It could be like Silver Sit. Um a reference to that bloody war that happened. That's it's what both a, cartoons are about. Yeah, it's a it's a trope. I mean, this is this is very very tropey in the way that it is structured. But it's I mean, come on. Even the the mountains are are shaped similarly. They even have the 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 the, the walkway and the the path in on it and well, everything. It could be in the description of the location. But if it is, then it's awesome. But if it's not, no, it is awesome. No, it, it, it is awesome. And this show is very happy with uh, referencing pop culture. Anything that allows you to look back and uh, learn something else is always definitely worth your time. Mm, true. But anywho, we arrive to the scene where the Who Feels are attacking the Flyers. And, well, they get introduced to the newest princess of Equestria, Princess Twilight Sparkle. I'm still surprised that Twilight's a new princess and nobody really knows of her. It depends on the episode. Some episodes like, oh, everyone loves Twilight. She's the most popular princess. I guess here they're so busy fighting one another, it actually kind of makes sense that they're not up on current events. What's that you say? There was a giant monster stomping through with draining cutie marks? Meh, fire another pr- pumpkin. There are episodes where, ah, that's not that's not your taxi, princess. That's my taxi. Get away from it. Yeah, I'm just thinking that Tarek, when the, he spotted these people, like, Oh, you know what? You can just keep on fighting. Um, I don't want your energy. Like, okay. It's like, I, I don't like the taste of hick magic. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, they are all earth ponies now that I think about it, mm, right? They are. They are. Yeah. And they're, yeah. and they're all the same color and they all look kind of the same, which means, you know, the family tree might be more a uh, stick. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, oh, yeah. 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 We, you're only Mari, our cousins. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, mm, yeah, no, 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 just no. Uh, after, <laughs> after meeting the Who Feels, they hear their problems and head off to the McCalls, which is, well, 
um, the neighboring hill. And same thing as before, did not know there's a new princess and introduced and Twilight tries to reason things out with reasons with what happened. Try to understand what's the cause of the problem. Well, hang on. I think we, we're skipping two important things. One, we have a male and female Big Macintosh on the parapets. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Which is kind of funny. I mean, I wouldn't really be able to tell one. The female Big Macintosh is just eyelashes and a pink polka dot headband. Mm-hmm. And also, Big Daddy McCold is probably the funniest joke as, well, that hat. We mustn't miss the fun visual jokes. Or the fact that little Fort McColt is actually pretty impressive. Oh, yeah. I think we miss on saying what the visual of the location is like. Um, the who feels have a problem with buildings and, in general, housing and mostly tools. They live in tents and they don't have proper living. While the McCults, they live in a fort. They have it good. It is very obvious that the weaknesses of one are the strengths of the others. So, yeah, I wonder if either of them has a a briefcase with the intelligence in the side. (laughs) Intel inside. Like, who here was also thinking of of Team Fortress 2? I don't play the game and I was thinking of it. I try to get away from Team Fortress, seeing as how I am now part of this Team Fortress cavalcade of characters and I get shot a lot. Oh, yeah. There's that. Like a lot. Well, but that, 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 that's your character, isn't it? Like, you have Im- I- immunity. <laughs> you have permanent immunity. You you cannot die. That's not immunity. That's torment. <laughs> You're like Super Mario. You have infinite extra lives. But still, um, carrying on to the story, we see that things are not as what they seem to be. With Twilight thinking that potential friendship solution number 28 being the problem solver is not. The hoof feels and McCall are still fighting. And yeah, it's not pretty. Twilight here is going through what she knows. Like she's just literally going by the book thinking that's exactly what she's going to, what she's going to be using to solve the conflict. It doesn't take long for her to realize that that's not going to help at all. And in between all this fighting, we do see the casualties of war, which is the animals. We see the squirrels being hungry. We see turtles almost getting stomped on. And we do see a lot of things in between. They are about to shoot, to shoot some mice inside a pumpkin. Cinderella would not be pleased. Oh, it won't. They even have like a ha- a house made out of the pumpkin. That's adorable. I think that the way that, because this is going to play later on the conflict resolution of the episode, Fluttershy kind of like solves the conflict almost indirectly. She's not really uh, concerned about the two families. The She's more concerned about the critters, which kind of like, it, it's kind of weird. It is true that in the end, it's bo- the both of them. Uh, working together to solve the conflict, but Fluttershy seems to be like the most uninterested on the two families. She's more cared about the little animals. I wouldn't say uninterested. This is sort of the funny dynamic compared to past friendship missions. Each side had a character who was sort of unwilling to go. Uh, R- Rainbow Dash didn't want to go to Griffinstone because she was so bitter about Gilda. Applejack didn't want to go because she wasn't confident in an urban setting. Twilight, by contrast, is overeager. She wants to take the lead, and Fluttershy, a rather passive pony to begin with, is happy to just let her do that. We do see the contrast in team-ups. The pairing between Rainbow Dash and Pinkie Pie was kind of cool. The pairing between Rabbit Jack is, well, some people might say OTP. And the pairing with Twilight and Fluttershy, well, one is eager, the other is just meek and follows. It does work well. And we get to see, well, the dynamic work within those two in this episode. And basically, it has been hinted before in Hurricane Fluttershy that she is just exceptional at rescuing animals. The one time Fluttershy can really move like Rainbow Dash is when a little critter is in danger. And also, she did carry that balloon with her friends while chasing Rainbow Dash. Although Rainbow was way down by the adrenaline rush. The adrenaline rush, or high emotion. But still, but still, it's there, and we know that she can do it if she puts her mind to it. Okay, so that, okay, so now I know how to get Fluttershy to do a sonic rain boom herself. Hold Angel by the ears and over a boiling pot. Do a sonic rain boom or I cook the bunny. You sure you want to do that, man? I think she's going to be the ever loving crap out of you or send in Harry the, Harry the bear to your, as, to, to your house. As long as Angel winds up a main dish, I don't care. 
Ay, ay, ay. Save favorite pony but want to hurt favorite pet. Ay, ay, ay. And then she's going to, like, give you the stare. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. And out. The stare, <laughs> stare me until I, my mind is mush. <laughs> uh, putting your fantasies aside, we go to the, <laughs> uh, we go to the Trojan cake. Wait, wait, wait. The cake? We've, we, you've gone too far. We haven't talked about Twilight's magical muscle. Yeah. Magical muscle? Princess yeah, Lu- to... Princess Luna is the only claim to the Royal Cantalot voice, for Twilight has a voice amplification spell. Ah. Straight from the Harry Potter movies. Yeah, she does have a spell to amplify her voice, which is awesome. Can't say anything more than that. And that causes the who feels to attack. How? Oh, because they thought that the McCults were the, were the ones, uh, uh, like annoying them. So they tomato them. Oh no, they did one another on you. Okay, don't mind on them anyway. Like this episode is just all over the place. Uh, not really. This is, is like conflict, 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 conflict resolution. Is that it? It's, it's that simple. It's an entertaining episode, but a review it does not make. I don't know. I, I'm finding fun. I mean, we, we're getting a blend of both the Hatfields and the McCoys with a little bit of Greek or Roman mythology and history involved. We're about to see a hillbilly phalanx. <laughs> yes, but before we get the Trojans with their cakes. You know, before before we go into that, I don't know if you guys noticed, but do you realize how, like, okay, think about season one. Think about Obra Barrow. Think about that episode for a moment. Do you remember how each side was either portrayed as just straight up warmongering, we're going to... Uh, pal- pummel these settled ponies right now. We're gonna pie these uh, b- buffaloes. Yeah, it was buffalo. We're gonna pummel these buffaloes to the dirt with pies. And in this one, I will say the characters are a lot more quote unquote uncute unquote human in the way that they are portrayed. I mean, they are not like straight up villains. They are not straight up the the bad guys. And they are a lot more fun to look at. I, I don't know. To me, these characters come off as more likable than the characters in, in the previous episode where we had conflict, which is Obra Barrow. Really? I thought Over the Barrel was fun in terms of how it presented itself. It's one of those episodes that is difficult for me to watch. <laughs> well, it's difficult for me to watch too, just because of how Pinky ruins everything. Well, even before Pinky ruined everything, that was the one episode where our heroines could have not shown up and would probably have been better if they hadn't. Between Rainbow and Applejack bickering and Pinky's song, our heroines actually made the situation worse. In terms of, well, how to make conflict in a story, that's how you do it. I agree with what Silver is saying, is that this is the this is one of those episodes where, oh, look at that, they're showing up, they're fixing the conflict, they're helping. Even if, in the end, they have to use some magic muscle, like you put it, and Twilight has to freeze everybody up while Fluttershy knocks some sense into all of them, that is still being more proactive and useful than it was in Obra Barrel. Which, by the way, anybody who says season one is better than the other seasons that come right after, shut up. You know what, you don't know what you're talking about. But anyway, we continue on with Trojan cake because I want to have cake right now. Are you hungry? A bit. So, as offering of peace, they send in cake. Carrot cake. Yay! Well, carrot cake's that in here? He's back in Ponyville. Well, I'm just talking about the cake. Uh... And La Gaffes, the cake is actually a trap. It's true what they say. The cake is a lie. Very yes, yes, but... this episode. <laughs> yeah, we need a valve release. <laughs> <laughs> a steam valve. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, well, but still, with that all-out war happens, the McCall attack the who feels and the who feels run into well into a set trap for the McCalls and yeah who wants to take this one because I got no idea how to deal with this. Well, first off, I just want to ask a question: Has anyone seen the photos of the uh, rather pudgy stallion next to Fluttershy who looks like he missed a few spots while shaving? Yes. How do you accomplish that? It's a decision. You wake up and you think. Yeah, I'm going to shave half of this and mix spots all over. Yeah. Well, okay, I will try to uh I will try to summarize this next bit for you. For you see the McColts in their builder archetype, they have precision formations, delta V formation. Except it's a triangle. So, <laughs> all right. 
So it's a triangle. They charge, but the hoof fields, they have a trap ready. So if there's Admiral Akbar on the side, ah, it's a trap. Yeah, we're all expecting this. I'll get a life. And so they pro, they pound them with produce, but then if the, if the produce will block out the sun, then the McGolds will fight in the shade and they produce the phalanx <laughs> of front doors. So I don't know. I mean, are you saying that the McColds are the Spartans and the hoof fields are the Persians? Apparently. Look, all all of history can be summarized as two groups want to fight each other over the same stuff. Mm-hmm. We we never get anywhere else. That's why I'm thinking that the more I think about it, the more this review should have been teams instead of scenes. Yeah. Oh, we're doing fine. Don't worry. What I do love is how upset Twilight is at, at Mama uh, Hooffield. And she's like, oh, wait, you were being serious? <laughs> yeah. It's like, these folks are so ingrained in fighting, or just so stupid. They've scripted out this this entire relationship. She came to talk to us first. That means she likes us more. I guess when you when you have I, I guess when you have such a long going uh uh conflict where everybody's angry at everybody else and nobody decides to agree with anyone, I guess when you have when you are dealing with something of that nature, it's difficult to break the habit, including putting little critters at risk. Which Fluttershy, she listens. What's that, Squirrely the Squirrel? <laughs> really? All right, Chippy the Chipmunk. <laughs> but still, but still. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, let's yeah. not talk. No, we're not talking about that. <laughs> yeah, we we do have upset Twilight ripping pages and vanishing them to oblivion. Which yeah, under, that's the way she's been dealing with. Mm-hmm. In in any other event, she'd be horrified at what she's doing. Oh my god, I put hours in that book. Yeah, and all those things doesn't work. Consider how dumb she is. She's so disappointed that the first time the map calls her, and this is a disaster. She's, <laughs> this is her giving up. Well, here's my question. Where are these pages going? Is Spike getting pelted by little wads of paper? <laughs> but anyway, but but anyway, to keep us on track. So the shy talks to the animals, and the animals talk to her about the whole situation, and so the shy is being, well, her usual self, willing to take them to home and care for them. And one squirrel talks to her and explains the whole situation. Tatushai talks to Twilight, and Twilight stops the war by using her freeze spell that she used in Castle Mania, was it? Yeah, it's the same spell she used for that one, but in that place, she only froze five uh, ponies, not six. Yeah, and her freezing all of them, she tells Fluttershy to come out here and explain the whole story ASAP. And, well, we get a backstory of how things eventually ended up this way. We get Grub Mhufil and Piles McCault. They are best friends, and they wanted to build and care for the land. Um, Grub wanted to start with planting crops, while Piles wanted to build buildings and houses. And ideas clashed, and they didn't mix, and they started a war. A war that lasted for generations. By doing that, they kind of broke their promise to take care of the animals and take care of the land. Although, if you realize it's for generations, then these animals are either very long-lived or it has been passed down from mother to son. Son becomes the father and tells the children. Tis a legend as old as time itself. I don't wonder where all these relatives ended up coming from because they only started as two. The two families forced the one radish to rule them all. Now is that I do wonder if more relatives came after they uh they they started to settle in, because I mean I we know that ponies don't reproduce by my mito- mitosis. I mean we know that it's 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 not like Generation One. They don't have a magic mirror in which they reflect and then they make a copy of themselves. No, they don't do that. So I'm pretty sure that there have been like I don't know relatives coming from another land and then settling in as well. Probably. So we get peace, and they promise not to fight, and they start working together to, well, keep their promise of their great-grandfathers. Also, it's kind of funny, they're at the very end where they look like they're about to start fighting again, here's Fluttershy with a chipmunk on her head, singing curses at them. <laughs> you realize that Fluttershy might be the most powerful pony in Equestria, really. She yeah. could turn the very animals of the land against you. Uh, and she also has a Draconicus for a friend. All she has to do is say, stop fighting, and you have, like, a horde of squirrels and ducks and rabbits 
devouring you from the ankles upward. <laughs> Make sure they use every part of my body. <laughs> uh, yes. And with that solved, their butt vibrates and case over. And they need to fly back with the heavy bags filled with books and books. So that's the episode. And what what more can you say? Twilight is eager to see what they do with the map next. She will regret those words mm-hmm. in two episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> like that, I don't see these biting me in the butt at any time soon. Dun dun dun! Dramatic rebirth. But so that was the episode. And what do you guys think? I cannot believe we spent this all this time talking about the episode without talking about how heavy the eyebrow game has been this season. <laughs> Because just look at not only the designs of these characters, but think about Moon Dancer, Moon Dancer's sister, the uh, uh, Tree Hugger as well had massive eyebrows. Oh my god, uh, we're gonna see another uh, character with big eyebrows on the next episode. We're gonna talk about. It's like I don't know why, but I kind of love it. The fact that the characters have these massive cartoony eyebrows, it's rather brilliant. Um, and nobody said anything about that. I'm disappointed in you guys. Well, it is kind of hick pony, so it does make sense. No, no, it's just the next... dancer was also a hick pony? No, mm. she's under groom. No, it's the next evolution of ponydom. The eyebrows are going to... Uh, they're main control <laughs> eyebrow people from the eyebrow planet. What they don't know is it's really a sinister race of caterpillars. Moving in to strike. Oh, God. I cannot think of actors with massive eyebrows, but I will say they'll come from that gal- the galaxy of those actors. <laughs> oh, well. But that's the only thing you have to say, James? Eyebrows? No, no, no. I just wanted to mention that because I'm like, oh, we didn't get to talk about the character design a lot. Like, we did talk about it very briefly. But, okay. Uh, final thoughts. What I have to say about this episode. Really liked it. I am um, uh, actually talking about it made me like it even more now. Uh, but I love the fact that there is no real villain here, that each side is portrayed rather fairly and with almost equal amount of screen time. I will be willing to say that the episode is fairly well divided in between the amount of screen time that each one of the, uh, each one of the families uh, has, uh, is getting. I also like the fact that uh, the conflict resolution comes from a fairly good point is like guys if you're not doing this, this for for yourselves just do it for each other do it for the people that animals, live with you do yeah. it for the creatures do, do it for the, the animals yeah do it for something else something bigger than yourselves that's something that i really liked um and i can kind of relate to what happens uh, in this episode because every now and then you will end up falling out of favor with some people and then you forget why you were even mad with them in the first place. Then the conflict goes big, grows bigger and bigger and bigger and you're like, why were I, why, why were we mad at each other to be in the first place? And you just rock and you're like, I don't know, but I'm still mad at you. It's like, that's, that's a very childish, uh, uh, attitude you have. And I'm very glad that this episode tackles it very, so well. So yeah, I'm, I liked it. Definitely above average. Definitely above average. More enjoyable than over a barrel. Well, what can I say? It's a straightforward story. A strong beginning, middle, and end, very clearly defined. I won't say it really fleshes out Twilight or uh, Fluttershy, but it allows them to be themselves, which is just as enjoyable. Twilight, it's been a while since we got to see her be super uh, book-heavy or insistent on her reading and treating this friendship problem as a basically one of Celestia's old assignments. And so I just really enjoyed it all around. Good humor, good setting, a good moral. I can't really say there's any weak point other than, once again, Twilight is letting the princess role define her. She thinks she has to be the one to solve this problem because she is the princess of friendship. But the map sent both of them. Twilight is still has to learn that being the princess of friendship does not make you automatically endowed with uh, with greatness. You are not automatically perfect as a princess. It is good that she's finally been given that, that lesson. This is almost a lesson more to her than it is to the audience, almost. Usually with the map episode, it always teaches one of them a personal lesson, where the first one was to Rainbow Dash, the second one was to Applejack, and the last one was to, well, Twilight. Those things have always been, well, in line with the whole um, map and lesson kind of deal. 
And as for me and what I think, it was an okay episode overall. I, I just, how do I put this? Like the trope that they have here, it's one of those tropes that I'm not fond of. Like you guys may like the episode and the episode for me is good, but I just don't like the episode because it's using that same trope. I'm not a fan of that trope. So, eh, personal reasons. Okay, if you don't want to go delve into, if you don't want to delve on that, that's, that's fair enough. The, the whole show is good. Like I do like, the pacing, I do like the story, I do like... Oh no, I mean the personal re- I mean the personal reasons, no, I, just, I don't mean the... No, I just don't like it, because it's it's so cliche, it's if you just sit down and explain and just listen and just get over it, it'll be done. Uh, it's a very tropey heavy episode, this one, and of course, not every trope is gonna be, uh, it's gonna work for everybody, that's why there are so many. So, yeah, perhaps this is the type of trope that for you doesn't work. For me, it works fine. Oh, I would say it doesn't work. I just don't like it. It's, like I said, it's, it works. The, the whole episode, the pacing, everything is working well. It's just awesome. But I just don't like this trope. That's about it. I would say it's the episode. It's just the trope for me. It's the trope. Yeah, okay. More than fair enough, dude. Don't worry. But other than that, I don't know. Oh, that's it? Is that, is that it? No, so quick? I'm right? just going to say something else. Um, the map, the map thingy, like, I think, I think we never did discuss about the whole map. Like, now that the map has called all six of them, which is your favorite story? Oh, good question. Uh, my favorite is The Lost Treasure of Griffinstone. Mm-hmm. Uh, bar none. I mean, not only does it have Gilda, they redeem her character fairly well. Give her a lot of backstory. They make her way more likable. And the story with the Aramasvi, the, the, uh, the, I, the idol of Boreas and, and all that. It's just, it's so, it's so epic and it's so good. And the art style for that episode in particular, it's so memorable and so well executed. I, I think that's the absolute best. Uh, while I consider the, uh, made in Manhattan, perhaps the weakest. Even if it starts my two of the, my two favorites of the main six, uh, I think that might be the, the, the weakest episode. While the Who Feels and the McCalls, I think is the, the, the middle, the, the middle ground. My opinion is very similar. Uh, well, I have some questions about how, uh, Griffin Stone presented the Griffins themselves and the maps. Willingness to chuck Rainbow into a crevasse. Mm. Uh, it was the most world building. It was the most expansive. It really lived up to the idea that the ponies are going outside the usual fair. This episode is in the similar vein. They're going somewhere they've never been before, but it's a little more familiar in that it's ponies. And so it's still very enjoyable. Made, made in Manhattan was fun story. Well done, but it was familiar territory. It was kind of weird how n- neither pony was taking advantage of the relationships they already had in that city. And so it just sort of, like, you guys aren't being very smart about this. There was a lot of derp in their part there. And this one is going to be your second with James? Yeah, I'm putting the Hoofields and McCall set number two on the friendship mission list. Then we have we have the exact same ranking. Yeah. Wow. That's the case that I'm, going to, I'm the odd one out. Because I think uh, Made in Manhattan is pretty okay. I like the whole story structure. I do like how it ends. And I do like how, well, not using the whole resource to the advantage is a dumb thing, but I just enjoy the current situation where, okay, we need to help the people. How do we do it? Find a problem. Oh, it's Coco Pomel. Like, when thinking over about it, everything is handed to them on a silver platter, but I just like the ending where we do it live, and in the end, it all turned out well. And the second one for me is going to be um, The Legend of Griffin Stone. I just like that one. And uh, because of tropes, I don't like this one. So yeah, it's going to be my third. Just because of tropes. That's about it. I think that's it, right? We, is there anything else we didn't cover? Well, we didn't so. say that it was... Re- we didn't say who wrote the episode, which is... it was. It's written by Christine Sanko, Sanko and uh, Joanna Lewis. Yes. Joanna Lewis and Christine Sonko wrote this one episode. They are the same writers who wrote Castle Sweet Castle and Rarity Investigates. So uh, they started on this season, and I think they have done a fairly good job, actually. They did manage to keep up the pace and quality on the on the writing. Definitely looking forward to what they have to offer in Season 6. Yeah, they do good writing, and that episode was good. Not my favorite, but it was good. 
sometimes I worry that I am way too optimistic and way too forgiving when it comes to this show. I don't know why. It's hard for me to get mad. <laughs> to get mad at it. I don't know why. You got mad at a few episodes before. I, I got mad, I got mad at, at, uh, well, I got kind of like, uh, passive at, what about Discord? And I, oh, I did got mad at the stupid putting your hoof down episode. That episode sucks. But after season three, God, is it difficult for me to get mad at one episode, like 100%. It's very, very difficult. Uh, but anywho, but anywho, next week's episode, what are you going to do, James? Oh, we're going to be talking about episode 24 of season 5, the main attraction, written by Amy Keating Rogers. That one is going to be a special one, because that's the last episode she will ever write for this show. It's very sad, but it's a happy sad. It's conflictive emotion. <laughs> yeah, but still, but still, this is a good one, this is a good one. It's gonna be fun. It's good time. Oh, it's definitely good times. My gosh. The cuteness factor on that episode is over 9,000. Yep. But anywho, but anywho, with that, I think we should take all these. So, I have been Norman Sanzo. I have been a Spanish person. And I be the head of the Silver Clan. Enoch! What, but who, what did you ride on? You you already have hindquarters. Uh, praise the Lord to pass the ammunition. Enoch! Okay, here are, here's the cilantro. There you go. <laughs> We'll guys see you next week. Bye bye. Adios. Bye. Oh. <laughs> I kind of missed that, but no. Oh.